All right, 97.7 Outlaw Radio FM listeners, right here, we actually have a phenomenal uh, phenomenal author, New York Times bestseller. He's a professor. He is honestly the jack of all trades. We got AJ <laughs> Hartley right here, right now. How are you doing this evening? I'm good, man. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Best I can possibly be, man. I got to say, huge fan of your work. You know, you do so many phenomenal things just, just, just for book book authors all around man like your stories are absolutely phenomenal so thank you so much for just a bit of your time here this evening thanks i appreciate that but i know you're a busy guy so i'm not gonna i'm gonna dive right up right into these things uh but i have to ask man taking you back from the beginning because like i mentioned you're a phenomenal author you've written so many amazing stories what what got you actually into writing books originally uh, i mean i've always been a, a storyteller I, I you know i grew up in a sort of working class industrial town in Northern England. And, um, you know, so sometimes it could be a bit bleak, <laughs> you know, and books were sort of my, my little escape um, from, from the world. And uh, I, I always wanted to, to write. I started writing like seriously when I was like 19, but you know, in those days, which was before people sort of self-published and there were before a lot of small presses and things, you know, you either got an agent and, and a big deal with a major house or you got nothing. So I wrote for like 20 years before my first uh, book came out. So and I've been doing it ever since. So, you know, that was 20 years ago. So. When you actually first wrote your wrote your first story, did you actually ever uh, ever include any of those like scripts actually in any of your actual books, or did you kind of keep those very early on writings just kind of for your own personal use? Yeah, no, just for my own use. I I, I was just uh, you know I mean I was a kid who liked to literally tell stories, you know, to uh, just speaking, you know, ghost stories and stuff like that, you know. Um. Uh. So, but yeah, none of them were sort of publishable kind of quality it was just you know kid stuff but um uh over the years uh you know i mean i would as i wrote stuff especially if i thought it was okay I, I, even if i hadn't found a publisher i would put it aside and maybe come back to it again in the future and, and rethink it and rewrite i mean i just published last year th or this year i published a book that i'd been working on for like 20 years a novel burning shakespeare which has you know, been sort of a lot of different things, um, you know, but literally I'd been working on it for 20 years. And I don't mean it took me 20 years to write it. I mean, I wrote it and then I rewrote it and I rewrote it and, I re you know, yeah. <laughs> well, well, like they say, AJ, everyone's their own, everyone is their own worst critic. You know what I mean? Like, as long as, <laughs> as, long as it's good on your end, that's all that matters, though. I guess, I guess, though, it's always nice to actually find readers, you know. So um, that that's the hurdle. And also, aside from actually being an author for a moment, you are actually currently the Robert Robinson uh, Professor of uh, Shakespeare Studies at the University of North Carolina. I was wondering if you can actually just tell us a bit more about that venture. And of course, what actually got you into being a professor? Um, I, I lived in Japan right out of my undergraduate degree. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I went to Japan for a couple of years, um, and uh, and I met my my wife there. She's now um, my wife. Obviously, she wasn't then, and uh, and she's a, an American. And I wanted a, a way to come to the states for a while, um, so I decided to go to graduate school. It wasn't really a career choice. It was just like something to do. Um, and I liked reading books, as we've already said. So it was a way to come to the U.S. and uh, and spend some time here. And, you know, you get into the master's program and then everybody's competing to get into the Ph.D. So you do that and suddenly you realize you've made a career choice uh, sort of without noticing, you know. Um, and, you know, I, I when I was a student, uh, I grew up around theater. Uh, so, you know, I'd always been interested in in performed drama and I, I when I, I was studying Shakespeare both as an undergrad and a graduate student I, I I particularly got excited about seeing this stuff on stage and then and I started you know working in theater myself directing and dramaturging and things like that so that's part of what my position is now I, as I say my 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 doctorate was in English but most of my interests as far as Shakespeare were concerned pushed me towards the performance side, whether that's performance history or theory or, or, or practically 
staging stuff, you know, so that's kind of what I do. So I'm actually in a theatre department. I, I have some teaching obligations in English, but my tenure home, so to speak, um, at UNCC is in theatre, yeah. And I also read in 2001 that you actually won Professor of the Year as well. It must have been such a, such a surreal experience to actually just accept that award, especially looking back with it being over 20 years now. Well, to be honest, I'd forgotten that that happened. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, that's the nature of, of the business, isn't it? It's like it's like awards and all that sort of stuff. It's great at the time, and then you move on to the next thing. And, and it's why I think writers are... Um, uh, sort of never satisfied because the goalposts are always moving. At least the goalposts of your own success are always moving. You know, they, you, first you just want to get a book out and then you get the book out and then you want to, you know, I don't know, hit a bestseller list or get a bunch of foreign translations uh, or get a movie or a TV show, whatever, you know. So there's always something to shoot for that you haven't got yet. So, yeah, I kind of <laughs> forget about things that happened a long time ago and just keep moving. You like the shark, you got to keep swimming. Otherwise, you drown. Especially in this, especially in the entertainment industry as well. You know <laughs> what I mean? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> but also, well, going back a few moments ago, when you said you actually lived in Japan, of course, you're actually you're originally from the UK. Like, what was it like actually like moving all the way across to Japan? Like, what was the lifestyle like? Was it a complete drastic change? Because some people <laughs> say Japan is so advanced technology wise. It is and it isn't. I mean, it's it's funny, you know, that there's, there's a, there was a lot of stuff that was streets ahead of anything that I'd seen before. But also Japan is a very traditional society, and that sometimes affects the way that they use technology. I mean, I, I was always amazed at people using, you know, computers and word processors that were like 10 years behind. Um, but it was what everybody used. And I mean, and still to this day in Japan, it's still a very cash driven eco uh, economy. I mean, people carrying money around, you know, that there's not a lot of credit card use and stuff like that, that you know, um, not, not when I've been most recently. But in terms of how, what it was like going over there, it was, <laughs> I mean, it was fantastic. I had a great experience. I was there a couple of years, but it was also pretty, uh, traumatizing is, is not the word, but it was, it was a hard shift, you know, cause I was there in the eighties, late eighties. So there's no internet. No, no. I mean, we didn't, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't. Have, so, I mean, I, I left, you know, where I had spent the vast majority of my life and bit and didn't speak to anybody from there except, you know, I'd call my family like once a month cause that was all I could afford. Um, and the rest of the time I was, you know, on my own. I remember being picked up in Tokyo after we had some sort of orientation thing and the teacher took me to the school where I was going to work and he's like, this is where you're going to be. This is where your office is. This is where your apartment is. This is how you work the bath. Uh, school starts in six weeks. Bye. And I was like, what? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and and I didn't, at the time, I didn't speak the language. Um and, you know, there would be times when, you know, days, maybe even weeks would go by without me having a real conversation with anybody. And I, I'd walk around the supermarket and like, I couldn't even recognize what was food. <laughs> you know, what I was like, the hell is that? I don't know. So, yeah, it was, uh, it, it was a fairly sort of steep learning curve. But in the end, it was fantastic. And, and I go back there as much as I can. And obviously, during your stay there, did you ever actually run into anybody that did in, did indeed in, uh, sorry speak English, or is it all just uh, Japanese? Yeah, oh, of course. But you know, I mean, I lived in a relatively small town, a couple of hours outside Tokyo, and the vast majority of people didn't. Even though they they study English in school, but they don't speak English. They they study English like it's a dead language, if that's possible. Um, and and so they do all these sort of grammatical jigsaw puzzles and stuff. Um, I, this was then. It's 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 not that bad now. Um, uh, but the vast majority of people did not speak English at all. And the vast majority of people, because of where I lived, had never seen a foreigner before, in person. So it's like every time you left the apartment and go out, people would freak out. People would see you on the street and you know be like genuinely surprised and uh i mean most usually in a good way and people were, were sort of kind and and approachable occasionally people 
you know, made it clear that they didn't want you around. But um, but for the most part, it was very positive. But it was, you, you did feel like this is not, we're not in Kansas anymore, you know? Not that I've been to Kansas either. But, <laughs> but also as well, in 2012, you actually won the, uh, the sorry, the SIBA Book Award for actually, for your book, uh, Darwin Arkwright. And uh, I was wondering if you can actually uh, tell us a bit more about this prestigious award. And of course, for the viewers that haven't actually had the opportunity to read this phenomenal book, could you tell us a bit more about it? And of course, where can we actually buy it today? <laughs> Good question. Um, the uh, so the Darwin Arkwright series was, um, was I had been writing mostly adult um, thrillers when I when I started publishing. I also did some some, some sort of epic fantasy kind of stuff, you know. But the Darwin Arkwright series was a middle. It's sort of Harry Potter esque. You know, it, it's a bit, uh, it's aimed at, at uh, a slightly younger reader. Um, and the premise of the story, it's about an English kid who moves to Atlanta, which is where I was living at the time. Um, and he doesn't know anybody there. You, you, you can hear a pattern here, right, in, in my stories, um, <laughs> where he's sort of uh, by himself. And one day he's in this mall and he sees a bird thing. Um, but it's not a bird and he follows it and it goes into this little shop that sells mirrors and it goes inside the mirror. So he can sort of look at himself in the mirror and, and see this thing looking back at him. And this is the start of this story. It's sort of portal fiction, right? He, he gets one of these mirrors and takes it home and discovers that after sundown, it turns into a doorway into another world, which is, you know, beautiful and strange and full of monsters that are trying to get out. Uh, and so it's the first of of three books. Now, in terms of where you can buy them, they are still available in the US. Uh, and, and the first one is called Darwin Arkwright and the Peregrine Pact, because, you know, nice, easy to remember <laughs> name. Um, but they have just been reissued in the UK under different names uh, called Monsters in the Mirror. And they're available as paperbacks. Um, and the paperback's really beautiful. They, they, they got a, a really great visual artists so the covers are fantastic and all these illustrations inside that are really good as well the first one is called monsters in the mirror the second one is called the miraculous mission and the third one is called the mirrors shattered but they are they're i mean you know as with all things you can find them on amazon and and so on yeah and I got to say as well, it definitely is a phenomenal series. I remember reading them actually years ago when I was just getting out of high school, man. And I really, really, really? enjoyed the read. Yeah, you we were... actually, we actually huh. read, we read them uh, back when, back in my 12th, yeah, grade 12th year. They actually read the very first book with us. Wow. I, I got to admit, I, I always read ahead. I didn't like reading in class because then you read one chapter and you got to wait a day. I would just take the book home and <laughs> read the whole book. And then I didn't have to pay attention in class, but it definitely is a phenomenal read. That's very cool. Thank you. I, 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 I assume that when I'm being interviewed most of the time, they haven't read anything. So <laughs> I, I, I always try my best to actually know kind of what I'm getting into, who I'm interviewing. I actually didn't put two and two together until after, until I was doing the questions for this interview. And I saw the name of the book. I'm like, Darwin. I'm like, that book sounds familiar. So I went in chat like read what it's about and i'm like i read that in high school wow that's cool <laughs> that's cool yeah well i mean this is the other thing about me that I, I have always sort of written in lots of different genres i write for different age groups and and as i say i'm mystery thriller fantasy sci-fi and stuff so so sometimes people who who've re who've read my stuff in one area don't even know that the other stuff exists you know um, and in the old days, when everybody used to buy their books in physical bookstores, they literally wouldn't because they'd be in one part of the store and they would be reading my fantasy or whatever. And they'd never go over to the mystery or thriller sections and find the other stuff that I was doing there as well. So, yeah. And also as well, you are currently actually working alongside Tom DeLong of Blink-182 and Angels and Airwaves. I was wondering if you can actually tell our listeners a bit more about that. And of course, how did yourself and Tom DeLong originally get connected? <laughs> Um, he was, I mean, I think he, he already had an idea for the Secret Machines um, project, um, and he was looking for somebody to partner with. He reached out to my agent, and I think initially he was just looking, he was, I think he was sort of making a lot of contacts, um, and my agent contact called me and said, you know, do you want to be, do you want to be considered for, for, for this particular project? And, 
you know, generally speaking, I don't do sort of ghost writing or that sort of co-writing. Tend, I'm tending to do my own stuff. But I had some things on submission that had been sitting around for a while. And so I didn't have like a, a project on the front burner. And I was like, well, you know, um, throw my hat in the ring. And uh, I'm sure he's looking at lots of people. And if he likes my stuff, uh, then we take it from there. So I, I guess she sent him some of my books and uh, and he liked them. And he, she said, you know, do you want he, he wants to talk to you and, and start sort of fleshing out what the concept is. So it was basically like an interview, you know. So so we, we had a conversation on the phone. It was several conversations. And he was like, and then he got back to me and he's like, yeah, I, I definitely want you to do this. Um, and I was still a little cautious initially because I was like, you know, I mean, I knew Tom as a musician. I didn't, but I'm like, I don't know anything about, you know, uh, what he's going to be as a, as a co-writer or anything like that. Um, and he said, well, you know, I really want you to do it. Uh, how can I, you know, sort of sweeten the pot? And I'm like, well, I just finished this other sort of sci-fi, the first of a new sci-fi series called Cathedrals of Glass. Actually, it wasn't called that at the time, but that's what it became. Um, and I was like, do you want to take a look at that as well? And he's like, yeah, sure, send it. So I sent it to him and he's like, and then he calls me back and he's like, yeah, this is awesome. I want three of those. And I was like, okay, you want three of those and three. And, and at the same time, like literally within about two weeks, um, Another the the other book that I'd had on submission, which is called Steeplejack, also landed at Tor, and they also wanted three books. So within the space of about three weeks, I went from having nothing under contract to having nine books under contract, um, <laughs> which was sort of terrifying to be honest. <laughs> uh, and and so so then I started working with Tom and and the first step really I mean we started sort of brainstorming right away and he would send me things and we would talk a lot on the phone and then he you know he flew me out to California we spent like a long weekend just sort of hashing out what these things were going to be and how they were going to work because you know initially when he first presented me with the idea and he said you know it has a sort of X Files y sort of you know, UFO phenomenon kind of um, subject matter. And I was like, well, when do you see this story set? And he was like, everywhere and in all periods. And I was like, dude, <laughs> what? And he's like, yeah, it's got to be a global story that spans history. And I'm like, I, I don't know how to tell that. I don't, I, I literally, because, I mean, if it was going to be one book on this period and then one book on this period, he's like, no, 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 no. It's got to be on everything all at once. And I'm like, so, so the first, the big issue was like, okay, so, okay, how do we, how do we figure out a way to tell this huge story um, in ways that feels coherent and unified, but which is sort of touching on all these other points of history and geography and stuff. Um, in different cultures and so on. Um, so that was the first big challenge. And I think, you know, once we figured out we we're going to use the, uh, uh, this, we we're going to use four core characters who are each going to have their own storyline. And we're also going to shoot the whole thing through with these little interludes, these moments from, from history, from other places and so on. And that all of this stuff would gradually start to weave together, but initially it would be quite disorienting for the reader. But if they stick with it, then those stories would start to come together. And I think, you know, the real breakthrough was when I thought, you know, the other thing that would be really cool is that in the final sort of quarter of the book, because I knew this was going to be a big book, I was like, let's make it so that the chapters get shorter and shorter and shorter as all these people, all their stories start to sort of intersect and all come together in the same place in the same time, as much as that is possible, so that it feels like everything's coming to a point. So it's not like a bunch of different stories. It's, it's one story being told from lots of different perspectives. So that was how it worked. And if you don't be asking, were you surprised at his like co-writing skills? Because like you said, you're always like a solo author. You do books yourself. So you were obviously a little skeptical getting into this. Were you surprised at his work ethic right at the beginning? I wasn't. I mean, I, I would. Skeptical is maybe the wrong 
word. I, I think, you know, the, the way that, that Tom framed it right from the start was basically it's like, I'm going to throw a bunch of ideas at you and I'm going to sort of direct you in terms of research and stuff that I want you to, to look at and things that I want you to watch or listen to, whatever. Um, and I want you to sort of run by, you know, build an outline build, that we can sort of talk about as we go. But when it comes to the actual sentences, that's on you. And I was like, perfect. Because I, I, that, that is the way that I would prefer to work. So when it came to actually drafting stuff, I would, I would write this stuff pretty much by myself, knowing that he knew where each section was going and what we were doing. And then I would send it to him and he would send me notes and say, well, I love this. This could use a tweet, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and, and so we would build the stories that way. And he's very upfront about that. You know, that we're, we're co-authors, but our jobs are very, very different. That, that he's sort of, you know, um, he comes up with the main idea um, and is sort of directing me to the things that he wants me to do. But in terms of writing character and, and plot and stuff like that, that's on me. That's my job. And also, before we move off the topic of Tom DeLonge and whatnot, uh, obviously, as, a, as we already know, the music industry got turned up by, turned literally up by storm with Tom DeLonge rejoining the group. And I do know that you actually put a post up, I believe it was a day or so before the, before the news broke. If you don't be asking, <laughs> when, when, when and how did you actually find out the news? Because me personally, as a fan, I knew that something was going on when he changed his Instagram bio. I was like, yo, it's, he's a, like I said, he's an author like yourself, right? Yeah. I make music. It's all about context. Once once I saw that, I was like, "Oh, something's going on." When, um, when did he do that? I think that uh, when he changed his Instagram bio was like August, I believe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I have been sitting on this since March. Um, so he, he told. I did a. I have a little YouTube channel where I mostly talk about Japanese rock music, if you can believe that, and um, uh, and I interviewed him on my little channel and we just sort of talked about you know various things and as soon as we had finished recording he's like okay some stuff i gotta tell you and they were in the studio then you know uh and the the tour was already planned um uh and so i i and and because part of tom's personality is that he he dreams really big and sometimes when we plan things you know, um, we we sort of driven by his enthusiasm and his his ambition. Uh, I don't mean ambition in terms of making money or, or something like that. I mean creative ambition, right? The the desire to produce big things. And sometimes, you know, life gets in the way or logistics get in the way. And and, and one of the things he said to me many times is, you know. I know it sounds crazy when we talk about this stuff and what we're going to do. And often it find, it winds up taking a lot longer than I think it's going to take, but we will get there, you know? Um, and so, you know, with the case, in, in this case, this was one of those things where I was like, cause I was monitoring social media from March onwards. And I'm like, how, how does nobody know about this? You know, how can nobody tell that Mark and, Travis and, and and Tom are in the studio together. How has nobody noticed? You know, so I kept waiting for the news to break. And when it didn't break, I thought, well, maybe maybe he spoke too soon. Maybe what he was telling me hadn't really sort of actually come together in the ways that he uh, that he thought it had. Um, and maybe this is not really going to happen. But he kept, you know, we stayed in touch over the summer and stuff. And talking about other other things and other projects and, and occasionally i would be like is this still happening are you still doing this and he's like oh yeah yeah just wait you know and i'm like i'm saying nothing to anybody um, <laughs> and uh and then yeah uh, so i was i was relieved when when it was sort of announced because i felt like i'd been carrying it around for seven months you know which is a long time to keep that kind of secret I got to say, I definitely agree with the secret side of things, man. Like, I don't know. Like, like I said, I, I had a feeling something was going on. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan, but I also observe situations. A lot of people were like, no, it's bull crap. I'm like, no, so, so, they're doing something. Like, you know <laughs> what I mean? Because I even knew Angels and Airwaves had a tour, and then it got canceled, which is understandable due to COVID, but it never got yeah. rescheduled. It's like, why wouldn't it get rescheduled? 
you're doing other yeah. things. Yeah, I mean, Tom, there's a lot of stuff in the works, a lot, a lot of stuff. And, 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 you know, some of it involves me beyond the Secret Machines and Cathedrals of Glass uh, series. Um, so, but yeah, and I was, I mean, I was talking to him about it recently about some of the, the other things that we're planning. And I'm like, when, when is this going to happen? Because you're, I mean, you're going to be on the road a lot. And he's like, well, you know, yeah, I mean, a couple of years, but, um, but it will be a couple of months on, a couple of months off. We will, he, he is very heavily scheduled and um, there'll be other things happening in between. And also, when you actually brought up at the beginning of the interview about your most recent book uh, titled Burning Shakespeare that actually released March 29th of, of this year of 2022, I was wondering if we can just touch base on that really, really quickly, because I know you mentioned it earlier on, but for the viewers that are just now tapping in and didn't get an opportunity to hear a little bit more about this phenomenal book, could you tell us a bit more about this 20-year uh, just <laughs> in, in the works book? And of course, like, is it actually available on Amazon or your official website to actually purchase? Yeah, it, it, everything, all my stuff is available on Amazon. And, and you know, if you go to my website, which is ajhartley.net, uh, you'll find, you know, uh, all the stuff, all my books with sort of links to, to where you can get them according to, to how you how you like to buy books, whether you prefer ebooks or physical books or whatever, audio books. Um, and uh, so Burning Shakespeare... Um, so the premise of the story is a guy sells his soul to the devil so that he can go back in time and wipe Shakespeare from history because he hates it so much. And it's a sort of comic, time travel -y thing. You know, uh, people have compared it to Neil Gaiman and, and Terry Pratchett, something like Good Omens or, you know, those kind of, those kind of stories. Um, and uh, and as you already said, I'm a Shakespeare professor. And, if, and in some ways that that's... It's a it's a plus in some ways, but it's also a minus. It's a plus because I know more than anybody needs to know about Shakespeare. Um, it's a minus for that same reason, right? That that one of the that one of the reasons it took me so long to get to a point where I was happy with the book was because I had to keep taking out my lecture notes. <laughs> you know, I kept having to sort of say. This is a story about characters doing stuff. It's not an opportunity for you to tell people about why you think Shakespeare is cool, you know. Um, and, you know, the the way the story works is that so the, the devil is a devil is orchestrating this guy's attempt to, to get Shakespeare out of history. And an angel um, is doing the opposite. An angel assembles a team of recently dead humans um, to stop the the devil from doing what they're doing right and so but for me the breakthrough was sort of rec was wrestling with the fact that most of those ordinary people didn't actually care about shakespeare and we're not convinced that saving shakespeare so that he survives into the present was actually a good thing and that the angel has to basically make the deal with them that you know what you're really doing if you're successful then you get your life back and that then immediately gives it raises the stakes for them. It gives them something very personal to shoot for, and um, and it means that you know the the story is then about people. It's not just about uh, about Shakespeare. And um, and I think you know the key to the story was taking them seriously and saying you know they might have really good reasons. Whatever I think about Shakespeare, they might have really good reasons to not want to have anything to do with Shakespeare. And there's, there's both comic potential in there, but there's also some seriousness, you know? Most of my books um, are at some point going to wrestle with ideas of some sort, you know? So that's all part of that. And I got to say as well, just, just hearing the story of that, or just, just the story and the plot of that book, I got to add that to my next reading list. It definitely, <laughs> definitely sounds like it's a very interesting read that I probably will not be able to put down. I hope not. It's. I think it's a fun read. I think. Uh, I think it it it, it does some. It, somebody said to me, you know, if you love Shakespeare, this is a great book for you. If you hate Shakespeare, this is a great book for you. <laughs> so you know, win win. 
I was just going to say that either way, a win-win especially, you know. But hopefully they like, they like Shakespeare, but if you don't, like, at least you might, might potentially get to see him die. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> no spoilers. <laughs> but also, I have to ask, because obviously you said you got a lot of stuff currently in the works right now. And I know some things, obviously, you can't speak about, but some you might be able to. And this all, I, every interview I do, I always like asking the individual, what is next? Like, is there anything I happen mm -hmm. to miss? Anything else we, you do still want to talk about or promote? You definitely have the floor. Uh, my next book is, is called Hideki Smith. And it's a... Um, technically a young adult adventure set in North Carolina, which is where I live, um, but it involves a lot of Japanese folklore and mythology. It's about a mixed race Japanese kid, like my son, um, who develops uh, a, a kind of um, uh, ancestral abilities, because suddenly there are these sort of strange creatures from Japanese mythology popping out in, in the mountains of North Carolina, and nobody knows what the hell's going on. And he has to fight them, um, and it's a, so it's a it's an adventure story. It's also a story about him, sort of wrestling with issues of his own um, identity and where he comes from and where he doesn't come from, right? Uh, and I don't know when the book will be out. I, I would say sometime, hopefully early next year, in the U.S. It'll come out from Falstaff Books in the U.K. I think it'll come out a little bit later. Um, from Uclan, who also did my you know, Cold Bath Street, and they, they did the the UK versions of the Monsters in the Mirror books as well. So, yeah. And also, the, uh, quickly before we part ways, if, if you can, I was wondering if you can actually like let our viewers know your social media handles. That way, they can they can uh, look further into you, check out more of your history as an author and a professor, and of course, just follow you and stay updated on everything you currently got going on. Yeah, so my, as I said, my, my website is uh, ajhartley.net. That in some ways is the, is the most important one, and that'll give you the, the connections. I'm also on, um, I'm on Facebook. I have a, there's an author page on faith, Facebook, um, and I'm on Twitter as, I never remember, I hate Twitter, um, or is it author AJ Hartley, something like that. Um, I'm on Instagram as well probably the same <laughs> See, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about publicity and marketing as you can tell so I'm very bad at it um, but I'm, I'm relatively easy to find AJ Hartley you'll find me hey you know what you you do what you do best and that is being an author you know what I mean you just <laughs> you, you let your team do the do the marketing for you man I don't blame you a team I wish <laughs> I had a team <laughs> But I got to say, first and foremost, AJ, just thank you so much for your time here this evening and just be talking about, you know, some of your, your some of your history within being an author and, of course, some of your newest projects. And I got to say thank you as well for years of amazing reads as well that so many individuals have the opportunity to enjoy. And I'm definitely looking forward to more years of books uh, co coming coming from you, man. So thank you so much, AJ, for your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much for having me on. You're most certainly welcome. Have yourself a phenomenal night. Cheers. Good night. Good night.